But it's not just the super radicals like that. This happens within the framework of church structures, so so much so that people like Mark Driscoll yeah. come out. And um, if you hit the right moment and you got the right, you know, chemistry and you've got the right dynamics, he stepped into Seattle and he became the giant pope in Seattle and had a niche movement of young people who all bowed to Mark Driscoll and look at the mess that created. Dan Borvin, clap on. <laughs> it's good to uh, it's good to have you back. Um, you were on you were on a few uh, weeks ago, and uh, I, I'm, I'm hoping to make you a regular. I don't know if you know that, but that's my goal here. We'll, we'll see. see. We'll see if I can uh, can keep Dan Borvin. I have a high price tag. <laughs> it's mainly uh, single malt <laughs> and uh, Cuban cigars. <laughs> you know, I can't I can't do that in the study. For, it's just really bad. Uh, I think. I think Spurgeon used to smoke in his study. I've always dreamed of having an ashtray in the pulpit. Now, I think that might be distracting, <laughs> but at least in the study would be... I'll, I'll settle for that. But an ashtray in the pulpit, I think, would be um, would be conducive to uh, a clear mind and uh, a clear presentation. I had, um, I had a pastor friend who told me the story that uh, one time... Uh, he went down to grab the water, and <laughs> he took he took the drink, and somebody put vodka in there. <laughs> this is right in the middle of the service, right? So he drinks it, and he he sets it down, and he says to the congregation, "This is really good water today." <laughs> I just want everyone to know. Um, Make the sermon more interesting. Yeah, yeah. See, now that we've offended everyone already yeah. out of the gates, we're good. Clean know. slate. <laughs> no, there's a right way to do these things, but <clears throat> no, it's good to good to have you back. You just did some some traveling. Lots of travel, yeah. Five yeah. weeks in Europe. Yeah, first time I've been in Europe uh, since COVID, so uh, it was great. I lived in England for five years in uh, the twenty teens, and then uh, traveled extensively in Europe during that time. So I very much have an affinity for that part of the world, and yeah. Uh, yeah. really a heart for the churches there. Yeah, and a desire to see the Reformation come back. Yeah to that part of the world. Uh So it was very encouraging. You know, we can't just think that what we see on the BBC news or whatever is the whole story. And obviously Europe is in, in general, in a general way in a post-Christian phase, but as we are in the States, we're right behind them in many ways and ahead of them in some ways, but there is a, there is much, uh, there, there are many things that should encourage us about what's happening in the church in not only the UK, but in, in mainland Europe as well. And it's not lost. The light has yeah. not gone out. Yeah. See, that's, that's, that's a really good point. I mean, we, uh, you know, Mike Brown is the uh, minister. He's our missionary, the Escudo URC in Milan. And there's a lot of good things happening in Italy. And we see, you know, it is interesting though. You talk to a lot of the immigrants from the U S that are in churches that came from Europe came over years ago, post-war, um, they go back and they come, they, they, they come back here with reports of, I, it's just dead, yeah. you know, and in many places. So, you know, it's good. It's, it's wonderful to hear there's some light happening again. Yeah. I mean, they have such a rich history. Um, you know, it's been, it's, it's interesting. It's kind of a burned over district, right. uh, in many ways. And you do, you do worry about that with the U S you know, Ministry here is really difficult these days. I mean, you're right. It's different. We're somewhat down the road from Europe now because of the sexual revolution, and we're the ones sort of infecting everyone with this garbage. But um, we are kind of like a finny burned over district across the yeah. U.S. And um, the question is how you look at how do you look at that? You know, do you see that as you know, gospels now going to China and other places and we're left behind or le- left behind, but, um, or do you see this as opportunity? And I think, yeah. I think that's the, the, the approach we have to take. I mean, I think we talked about this last time, but yeah. You know. And what's the overall goal? Is right. our overall goal to have a Christian nation, right? to have a Christian culture where we live like Mormons right? and have a lot of outwardly moral people who are lost and going to hell? Yeah. Or is our goal to have churches thriving, the gospel being proclaimed, the means of grace being celebrated every Lord's Day, in the midst of a Babylonian culture? Yeah. Of course, we don't want our culture to be, you know, to descend into uh, total depravity. 
but mo- most important is that our churches thrive, and they can thrive even when surrounded by utter darkness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and thrive in unique ways. I, yeah. I mean, t- take it take it where in before, where the church was so diluted, and you know, the, uh, it's, it's Corinth, right? right? The church had become worldly. The church had forgot the gospel. The church wasn't administering the sacraments. There was no discipline, so all the distinctiveness of the church was lost in in many different ways. And uh, you know, this this is a kind of judgment that we've seen on in America now. Well, that's going to affect culture some way. If you don't have any light, the light's going to go out elsewhere, yeah. right? And, um, you know, but if we can recover in our day, <laughs> robust churches who are, and this is a big deal, who are simply taking the faith seriously. Yeah, That's been part of the problem is that t- for too long, you know, I think in the States, it's just been, it's been lighthearted. Nothing's been serious. There's no gravity of the message. There's no hope that's been given. It's simply worldly talks that, you know, seek to pat people on the back and tell them how to lead a better life. There's no power in that so that, you know, now if we recover this in the midst of the darkness all around us, that light is going to shine bright. Absolutely. You know, and it's interesting to see in Europe, you know, they, they went through that cultural Christianity for not only with Christendom, Mm -hmm. but even after the Reformation, uh, 18th, 19th, into the 20th centuries, but there's basically no cultural Christianity left in Europe. Yeah. So they are very much in a, in a post-Christian culture but in the midst of that, it allows the gospel to shine forth even brighter because there's no reason to be a Christian and certainly a Reformed Christian for there's no societal benefit yeah. <laughs> to yeah. this. You better really believe it. It's almost like it's not quite as serious as a situation in China is where your life is on the line, but there's no social benefit to being a Christian in Europe. It's, it's actually a negative. So the people who really believe, they really believe. Right. Right. The they church members out. are all in. Mm-hmm. There's no halfway with Reformed Christians in Europe. And that's very encouraging when yeah. we don't have that always in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, you know, we are the church of Laodicea in the U.S. There's a lot of lukewarmness. And I think, you know, I think uh, cultural Christianity is still very prevalent here. Yeah. <laughs> that's like, it's one of our big challenges that essentially what we've, what it's done is still holding the remnants of what Christendom was and the church together. We've simply tried to create bubbles, <laughs> bubbles and protect us from all of this and still operate merely culturally. I, th- I think that's a, a big challenge. I think for us, you know, why are people involved in the church? Is, is it just because it's family? Is it just because this is something we've always done and uh, there really hasn't been, in some, an embracing of the gospel themselves. That that model still is very common in the states, but I think it's going to get a lot harder to maintain that. Yeah, you know. So there's. It was very encouraging to be in the UK, to be in Romania, to yeah. be in Italy, to visit our missionaries there. And uh, there's much to be in prayer for, especially the biggest thing that everyone told me to be in prayer for, to work for, toward is men. They need men. They need men to serve as leaders in the mm-hmm. church, as pastors, elders, and mm-hmm. deacons. So, something to pray for. We need to be yeah. in prayer for that. We need to seek to raise up men to go there, because yeah. there aren't enough locals right. to uh, be raised up to do that. So we need pastors, even elders, yeah. to move to one of these countries, yeah. work a job, o- open a business, whatever, and serve as an elder would be tremendously beneficial. Sometimes that's attractive. I think I'd like to go over there, but <laughs> it'd be nice. Yeah. Only in certain Scotland. spots. I want to go to Scotland. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, this was Paul's concern, right? Train up elders in every city. He was constantly concerned about this. Yeah. And was calling the church to do this. So it is, it is, um, it is what Jesus told us to pray about. Fields are white for the harvest. Pray, pray. And that needs to be the core, I think, responsibility of the church in these in this regard. Yeah. Um, well, maybe that'll that's a good sort of segue to talk a little bit about, you know, challenges today in terms of uh and, and what is a biblical church? Those are those are things I we were talking about before the program. You know, um I grew up in a tradition, you know, where I was I was in the Reformed tradition from the beginning. So I grew up understanding, you know, polity. I grew up understanding a sort of presbyterial government. 
I appreciated the checks and, and, and the checks that were put in place to protect pastors and the sheep. Um, but I, I, I've come to realize that there are a lot of people who have grown up in American evangelicalism who really struggle with the nature of the church, how it functions, its tasks, and the protections that are put in place. Um, I don't know, what, what was your background? Yeah, my background is the opposite of that. I come from a Baptistic congregationalist background with churches that would have one pastor and then a deacon board, mm -hmm. and the deacons basically And no as, elders, right? No elders, yeah. yeah. Which is remarkable. I've never understood that in the Baptist. Like, why, why, why does it always deacons and pastor, but you bypass the, the entire office of elder? I, I've never yeah, understood good that. Good question. I think they would say, some of them would say the, the pastor is the biblical elder of the New Testament. So just one elder. But of course, the argument against that is Paul always writes to the elders at the church of, <laughs> yeah. meaning more than one. Which creates in the in that tradition, a little popes. Right? <laughs> well, that's where I was going. So yeah, most of the churches that I came from, the pastor was very much the boss. Yeah. And not always in you know a, a despotic way, but he pretty much ran the show. Mm -hmm. And the deacons weren't always yes men, but um, it it wasn't there was an um, unspoken non parody yeah. going on. We we of course believe in the parody of elders and and a parody within the church yeah. of elders and pastors. This was not that at all. Yeah, and in some cases, uh, pastors had almost total power yeah. of churches. I was in an example of that is. In some of the churches in the tradition from which I come, the pastor, when he, when he comes to a new church, he rewrites the doctrinal statement of the church. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they don't have a common confession, Yeah, whether it's the three forms of unity, the Westminster Standards, even the London Baptist Confession. They have their own doctrinal statement, and the pastor gets to rewrite that in his own image. When yeah. he comes to a new yeah. church, yeah, this is th this is so American. You know, oh, yeah. like, I mean, I'm sure it's it's uh, been applied across to other nations and times, but there is a peculiar American phenomenon to this. I think it was Bob Godfrey told me a story one time um, that he was at the gas station and uh, he ran into Harold Camping, hmm. and uh, he said, "Harold, how are you?" You know, I don't know if people know this, but Harold Camping was the Sunday school teacher in the Alameda CRC, where where Bob came in to the faith. Was right? converted, yeah. Yeah, was converted. And uh, Harold said, um, yeah, great, Bob. I'm, I'm rewriting the Heidelberg Catechism. <laughs> <laughs> so you're doing what? <laughs> um, but, you know, here, here's a perfect case. You know, this guy gets a platform. He gets, he gets millions of dollars. He starts family radio, which, which was remarkable, remarkably used in many different ways. Um, I mean, I used to listen to it and, um, you know, brought people into the church. But then Harold went crazy. And, you know, he declared the church age ended and he declared that people needed to leave the church because there were no, God was not working in the church anymore. And then came a whole series of predictions. And I think that's a good illustration of what can happen in American evangelicalism. But it's not just the super radicals like that. This happens within the framework of church structures. So, so much so that people like Mark Driscoll yeah. come out. And um, if you hit the right moment and you got the right you know, chemistry and you've got the right dynamics, he stepped into Seattle and he became the giant Pope in Seattle and had a niche movement of young people. There were no older people really there. Right. It was a niche movement of young people who all bowed to Mark Driscoll and look at the mess that created. Camping and Driscoll are textbook examples of the importance of having people in your life to tell you no. Right. <laughs> All right. When right. Harold Camping came up with the idea to rewrite the Heidelberg Catechism, <laughs> yeah. someone in his life should have told him, that's a horrible idea. Yeah. You should not do that. Right. When Driscoll was running roughshod, driving the Mars Hill bus over people, as he right. himself said, yeah. he needed men in his life to tell him no. He did. That's exactly right. That is exactly right. When yeah. we have prominent evangelical leaders redefining faith, yeah. which has happened in the last year or so, uh, the definition of faith has stood for 500 years or more. Why do we re need to redefine it? But some guys think they should. Yeah. So when, when you come up with something like that, 
you know what? We've had a definition of faith for 500 years, knowledge, assent, trust, and, and so on. Fuller, uh, more fully fleshed out than that, but a simplified version. When someone says, you know what? I can improve on that because we've got it wrong mm-hmm. from the very beginning. Yeah. I will improve on that. Someone in that person's <laughs> life should say, don't do that. And that should be elders. Yes. That's, that's why elders are put in place. We know? all need men in our lives to protect us from ourselves and right. our terrible ideas. Right. We're all capable of really bad ideas. Yeah. And we need men to protect us from those things. This is why Machen said, there's nothing new. Right. I mean, if, you ha- if you're in a church or you're in a situation where your pastor has come up with a new idea, a new doctrine, and this has, and, and this is why Paul warned against, you know, every wind of doctrine, every new idea that comes about, and it has taken by storm the evangelical world, and you're getting a, a, a niche following around this pastor, and it's growing fast, always, always, always a red flag. Um, you should run the other way. Yeah. Because we have been very clear throughout his, our history. We have roots. We have foundations. We have, we have creeds. We have confessions that are meant to protect us and protect the doctrine that we confess to provide a hedge around us so that this stuff doesn't happen and corrupt the very faith, the deposit that's been handed to us. So it's, you know, this deposit of faith has been passed down yeah. to us. So we should be very cautious within ourselves when we come up with a new idea that no one has ever thought before yeah. and how we can improve Christianity yeah. for the first time. It's it's we've all been waiting for me to come along and yeah. introduce this new thing. Yeah, it's all it's all really at the heart of it, an impatience with the gospel, right? I mean, we want quick fixes. We want something because listen, uh, it's this is hard. Um, nothing seems to happen fast. The the, the ministry's trench work. Um, and we want some new solution. We want some quick fix. We want to be able to tally up our numbers like evangelicals have done. Look at how many baptisms. Look at how many people are coming. That's evidence that the Spirit's working. And because of that, because we've been so impatient, we're not satisfied with that powerful gospel message that is we're called to preach faithfully in season, out of season, preach the gospel, preach the word, that it is the power of God of salvation yeah. for salvation. But we are always on this trajectory to find something new and better. And Do we really believe it or not? Right, right. And that's why we have abuse, yeah. right? I mean, if you really believe the means of grace are what God uses to create faith and to strengthen faith, then we will trust those things. And your example is exactly right. And we know it. We know what we need to do. It's just like with losing weight. Everybody knows diet and exercise yeah. are the solution. Of course, this is what we need to do. Now, of course, there are... No, but there's a pill now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, there are better ways to do a diet, better ways to exercise, yeah. but those things, everybody knows this. Yeah. We look for the pill. We want the magic pill that yeah. will melt the weight off of us right. because we don't want to go through the boring drudgery of diet and exercise. We don't want to go through the boring drudgery of the ordinary means of grace. We want more flashy, exciting yeah. things uh, week to week in the church, or this, this this new thing will unlock the key to the Christian life and the prayer of Jabez or all these the fads that come yeah. along instead of just simple, ordinary means of grace that God yeah. has given to us that he's promised to bless. For some reason, we don't believe in the power of those things. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, it's, it's really true. If you see some guy, there, there's always this guy that pops up on my feed. If you go to the health section, so he's, he has his shirt off and he's all ripped up and he, he has this new way, you know, of looking like him. You know? <laughs> you know? So, and, and, and look at the, look at the views and look at the followings of this guy. It's unreal how many hundreds of I don't know, thousands of followers this guy has because he has seemed to offer the new way. It's no different in the church. But what I don't get is, you know, we've had all these fads come and go. You mentioned prayer of Jabez, you know, um, purpose-driven life. Yeah. If they worked then, why don't they work now? Yeah. You know, it's like you're always looking for the next one. But shouldn't that be a basic question of this? Is anyone still reading the prayer of Jabez? Right. Is anyone reading purpose-driven life? Is anyone reading this stuff today and saying, wow, is it still selling its millions? Yeah. But the gospel is still accomplishing what it intends to comp- accomplish. Right. And the fact that they're moving on to a new thing, you're exactly right, proves that they didn't actually work then. <laughs> because if they did really work as right. everyone thought they did, well, well, yeah, we would continue to use them forever. Yeah. This goes all the way back. Not, you know, way back, centuries, millennia, but even nearer to that, to Charles Finney. I always yeah. say 
every problem in American evangelicalism can be traced directly to Charles Finney. He yeah. is the, the font of all our problems. And yeah, he came up with the new measures. Yeah. A new way to, to bring people into the church, to attract people, to get uh, decisions for Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of trusting the the measures that God promised, the means of grace we see in Scripture. Yeah, and and Finney redefined the doctrine of sin. I mean, and just he denied justification by faith alone. So you know, you you look at look at the theology itself that drives this. And what we're talking about is enthusiasm, right? right? We're talking about certain enthusiasts who've come up with a new measure. You know, he puts this anxious bench up at the front of the church, and he. He has people to come forward and weep and to mourn and to make this momentary decision for Christ. This seems like this big, exciting thing. And, and hey, thousands came forward. Thousands came forward and did this. And it's really interesting. I think I was reading years ago uh, on these new measures that some, there was some there were some pastors at that time, and obviously there were other guys like Nevin and people in these enthusiast movements who would write against it. But he said, Let, we should look over, you know, the fields that we have we have ministered in what is now the moral state. This is an irony of those since we left them. He's talking about Finney's measures. He says, I've groaned and regroaned again to see the sad, frigid, contentious, carnal state into which the churches have fallen and fallen soon after we left them. Interesting. Yeah. That there's no power in it. I mean, this was the, this was the, um, Oh, what was the big events we used to have? And Promise Keepers. Promise Keepers. You know, that, was yeah. like, that was the major in the, is that 80s or 90s? 90s. It was 90s. Yeah. Like, you know, everyone Football stadiums. went to the Promise Keepers and made that decision. It was the same thing. Totally. The same thing. But where is it today? Right. Why isn't it working today? And the, the, Is it just the moral state? That's what you right. can say. What is it? And not just the moral state, an, an easier, uh, clearer uh, data point is church membership. With any quote-unquote, movement of the Spirit, the easiest way to track and determine if that truly was a move of the Spirit is church attendance, church membership. Right. We see that in the New Testament, and 5,000 were added to the church. Mm -hmm. We see the, already that happening in the New Testament. So that's a good data point for us. And with the Second Great Awakening, church membership does not explode. If this was truly a, a work right. of God, after the fact, not only is there moral decay, but we don't see church membership explode with, with committed Christians in the church. We see the burned over district. Right. Where, like, yeah, the promise keepers. Where are these 50,000 guys in a football stadium in 1995? Where are they today? Has, has those, are there churches flourishing th no. that they came out of? No, they're, they're uh, weak at best. So and if, if it truly is a work of God, we will see a visible data point, proof of the work of God, and that is church membership, attendance to the means of yeah, grace. Yeah. And and one of the genuine works of God, the Protestant Reformation, we do see that. Mm -hmm. Church attendance exploded yeah, right. in the 16th and 17th centuries. There's a litmus test. Like, yes. What does it do inside the church? Because all these movements are outside of the church, and they teach people to, in many ways, and it may not be sort of directly, but implicitly, indirectly, they teach them to find the experience outside of the church, to find the real thing outside of the church. I mean, we've been saying this, you know, in evangelicalism for years, you know, we've been teaching people. I remember seeing a church sign one side said, pastor, everyone, you know, <laughs> you know and, uh, and, and so we've taught people that, and, and there are even churches that, you know, emphasize this. Listen, you know, the real thing happens out there. So we're going to cancel worship to get you out there, go out there. And that's been the mentality of the, of the whole movement is to take people outside of the church. And we don't see the sort of commitment to the church of Jesus Christ and the commitment to the ministry as the power of God to say. And the biggest example of that probably 15 years ago now was Willow Creek. Yeah. Yeah. With their, uh, what did they call it? Revolution or something. And Saddleback. Yeah. Yeah. But Willow Creek said after the, after this like multi year study of the people who attended their church, and the dissatisfaction, the most committed people were actually the most dissatisfied. The ones who attended regularly were very active in the church. They were dissatisfied with the church, so they determined after this multi million dollar study that these people, their term, they should be self feeders. Yeah. So instead of getting fed by the church. Instead of getting fed with the means of grace on the Lord's Day, they should be self-feeders. So they don't need the institutional church as much as 
the more immature Christians, the new Christians, these right. self-feeders should go off on their own. Right. And that's where they get their their benefits. Well, why do they need the church at all then? I guarantee yeah. you they didn't tell these self-feeders, and please stop giving an offering to the church. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't worry about yeah. paying the pastor. Yeah, exactly. We still want your money. Yes. But we don't care if you're here. We'll just make this for the baby. I mean, Paul had a lot to say. Oh, Paul. Hebrews. He didn't really write Hebrews. But, <laughs> um, you know, in Hebrews, there was a lot, he, the author there was really concerned about this. Yeah. You, you guys are remaining in this place where you should be further down the road. And he pressed them on with the deep teachings and gospel shown throughout all scripture. So you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I was thinking um, a moment ago when you were talking about um, sort of the revivalism and the things that happened years ago, I preached in a, in a church, I won't mention where, but I was preaching on the rich young ruler. And that week was the last Billy Graham crusade here in San Diego. So I was a sim student at the time and uh, I was preaching on the rich young ruler and the pastor was there and they, they got up ahead of time and they showed the Billy Graham crusade video. I didn't know that any of this was going to go on and thousands are flocking forward and he's pushing, the pastor's pushing everyone to go. Well, I get up and preach on the rich young ruler and this guy comes up to Jesus and he says, you know, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Two verbs. And Jesus thunders down the law on this guy. And I made the point, he just broke every modern evangelistic approach exactly <laughs> oh, right. in our day and let this guy walk away brokenhearted. Yeah. Why? Because he had no conception of his sin, the need for the gospel, who Christ is, not just merely a good teacher. Right. And uh, Jesus is not about to cheaply offer the Christian faith to anyone who wants to come to, to him on their terms, which is the very thing we're, we see in these movements. He needed a course in church growth principles. <laughs> <laughs> the pastor was in the back going, I, I, I guess we're on video, going like this and looking around ready to stop me, you know. Um, As I, people walk I, out of the church, <laughs> Dr. Godfrey would call that a church reduction sermon. <laughs> How to shrink your church. John the opposite Six, right? of church growth. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, but I think I think it illustrates well this, this, this point of the impatience that we have for the gospel message, our lack of confidence in it to do what God has promised that he would do. I think of these little, I don't know, it burdens me. When I was up in Washington, you know, there was, um, there was a situation where all the Reformed churches, you know, a lot of them were going progressively liberal. And this, this certain church purchased a shopping center, and it was pulling out all the Reformed people into this broad saddleback model. It was, this is in the height of the saddleback model. And, um, and they, of course, were marketing the gospel. They were, they were running around saying, listen, are you tired of old dead religion? They put signs all over town. Are you tired of, you know, um, powerless, powerless Christianity? Come over here. And, of course, in the parking lot were the jumpy things for the kids. And they did baptisms in the pools out in the parking lot. And it was this new approach to church, right? And everyone was getting excited about it. And I, all I could think about was the little pastor... And I'm not talking about myself, but you know, like the, the pastor down the street, you know, in the small 30 person church who faithfully preaches the gospel every week and the pressures on him are immense. His, the, the people are saying, listen, our children are going down to this church. You need to do something different. You need to change right away. We're failing. The church is going to die. And this minister every week gives himself to work through the scriptures and proclaim the gospel in a way that's faithful. Thus the day in America. Yeah. You know? And do we believe in the truth? Do we believe in what God has commanded us to do and what he has promised to bless? Or do we want results? Right. And that's the great question. And that pastor down the street, if his elders are solid, if his congregation um, appreciates God's word, they will support him in being faithful to what God has promised to bless. And we're not looking for results as the world sees them. We're not looking for results necessarily to be visible in this age. Right. We won't know the true results of ministry until we get to heaven and see yeah. what God actually did. Mm -hmm. And how many of the 
uh, the visible results that we've seen from these movements that we've mentioned, how many of those are genuine? We don't know. And so we, we won't know until we get to the age to come. But we have to, because we can't see the genuine results, we can't see what God is actually doing in people's hearts. We have to trust the means of grace, the methods that God has promised to bless, trust the truth, the truth of the Word, trust the the reality of what Christ did in crushing the rich young ruler with the law. Mm-hmm. How many of these guys in the church growth movement and all these faddish uh, gimmicks are willing to crush people with the law as Jesus did. Right. We don't want to send that guy away. We want yeah. him to come back. We want to make yeah. him feel comfortable. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned Saddleback. Their whole model was, right. you know, the Harry and Mary. How Church do, for unbelievers. How do we make Harry and Mary comfortable, you know, when they come into church? Um, you know, and I've always said non-Christians should not feel comfortable no. in your church. No, absolutely not. It's not for them. No. They we should are be worshiping. really uncomfortable. They should have a... An awareness within themselves that I am not in a place that is catered to me, that is catering to me, and they should be aware that the the other people in that place are in a different spiritual location than they are. Yeah, right, right. We don't fit in here Mm -hmm. because the reason is the genuine believers who church is for— as they enter into the throne room of God, they literally enter into another world. Right. And the unbeliever does not. Mm -hmm. He is a witness to those people entering the other world, and he should know something is different about what these people are experiencing than what I'm experiencing. You're not on the same level. 